We were studying this morning about the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul was Saul. He was religious. Uh, as to the law, he was a Pharisee. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Kind of in our modern day, he was kind of like somebody that would have graduated with honors from Harvard and then went to Oxford University for his doctorate. I mean, he was extremely well credentialed. And we were talking about the difference between religion and relationship. I think that uh, some of us grew up, as I did at least, you know, kind of getting cleaned up and going to church for one hour, and our parents would be like, you can give God one hour of your time every week. And, and so we kind of just, you know, have that religion in our lives, but not really the relationship of God. And knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior and how he changes the inside of our life. And Saul was a great example of that. He was pursuing religion and didn't know Jesus and had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus and went blind for a short time and then his eyes were opened and he knew Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and so he goes on then to become Paul and writing uh, a lot of the New Testament. Well, one of the uh, wonderful things that he wrote was the first and second uh, epistles to the uh, church at Corinth, the uh, second Corinthians. So if you would, open your Bibles to page 1753. I want to look at uh, one of my favorite chapters, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in the Bible, you know, where most of us are coming uh, less than 24 hours back to church from a funeral. And a lot of things take place at funerals. Uh, friendships are rekindled or reconnected. Sometimes you see friends or family members that you haven't seen in a long time. Um, but we have a tradition in, in some cases, people opt to have an open casket. And, and you have a wake, and you come up, and you, and you see uh, the person, your loved one. And um, it's a strange thing to, to do that. And it's a strange thing to see uh, the, the, the person that you've known and loved uh, lying in a casket. And to me, uh, on Friday when I did that and saw Gary, I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. That somebody that was with us just a few weeks ago now is, is uh, at home with the Lord. And it's interesting about the body, and I'm not trying to be morbid at all, but a body is almost like a, a compartment. It's almost like a puppet. I mean, you have the Holy Spirit. If you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have your own soul, you know, your personality, your intellect, the gifts that the Lord has given you. And then you have your physical body, and the physical body just kind of gradually, in my case, starts to get bigger, uh, gets a little bit weaker, uh, gets a little bit slower. And for those of us that live a, you know, a long, full life, gradually over time, our, our bodies kind of wear out. And, and you see that when you're looking uh, down in a casket that really you see kind of a shell or a, 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 you know, a compartment of a person. Now, some of you might know this, that um, Paul, the writer of this, was a tent maker. So he was ministering the gospel. He was proclaiming Christ. He was spreading the, the message of the gospel. But also for a living, he was a tent maker and he made tents. And so let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and see what it kind of tells us to kind of gain a perspective of how short our lives are and how long eternity is. And really what I think Paul is trying to do is help us to kind of focus on the long term, the fact that we're here 80 years maybe, 60 years, 40 years, sometimes maybe 90 or 100 years, but that, that is just a drop in the bucket compared to all of eternity. So help us to set our minds on that. So starting in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, about our new bodies, he writes this, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. So really, kind of like a tent is temporary, right? I mean, you know, it's almost spring and we could probably go out now and, and, and sleep in a tent um, I see little kids uh, running around. I mean, when I was a little kid, I had a tent, and then the funnest thing was getting an extension cord and bringing it out and then having like the radio or a TV playing inside the tent. But it was really temporary, and our bodies, your body, your flesh and blood, the heart beating in your chest, your brain processing information, your, your nerves and muscles and bones and all of these things are temporary. 
It's like a tent. So he's saying that this is going to all be over at some point. Unless the Lord comes back first, you're going to go to the conclusion of your life and your body is going to be really be gone. But that you, Christian, you have an eternal body, a brand new body that you will have that's eternal, that will last forever. And it's not made by human hands. It's made by God himself. I was thinking about Gary this morning, that, that he had his hip replaced. And uh, he's up in heaven because of Jesus Christ, because of the forgiveness of his sins, and that, uh, that hip replacement, no more hip replacement, right? He's got a brand new body, he's got a brand new hip, he's got a brand new, and, 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 and it's an eternal body, it won't wear out. In fact, we were originally built, Adam and Eve, for eternity. So before sin entered the world, the world was perfect. The world wasn't fallen. Their bodies were perfect. They weren't going to die. But as sin entered the world, the consequence of sin is death. But there's eternal life in Jesus Christ. And it's not made by human hands. Now go to verse 2. We grow weary in our present body... And we long, this is for Christians, we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. We long for that. For we will put on our heavenly bodies, we will not be spirits without bodies. So the moment that you close your eyes in this world, by the grace of God, through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, paying the penalty for your sins, he shed his blood, he, he was whipped, he was beaten. I was imagining this this morning, that they, uh, that they whipped him, that, that they were scourging him, that they were tearing f- flesh from his back with these whip and the, and the, the, uh, the glass and the metal shards and, and, and the, the crown of thorns on his head. All of that was happening and he was bleeding and dying on the cross after he was tortured, nails in his hands, nails in his feet, and, and giving up his last breath. And he did that because he knew that in order for you to be with him forever, they had to pay a price. They, meaning God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, three persons of the Trinity, God is one. That Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and three days later rose again from the dead. So he overcame death, to make a way back to God for you so that when you die here, it's not over, you will be in the presence of God forever with a new body. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and we sigh, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. Remember the disciples? They were were saddened. Jesus was going away. Jesus was going away. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do, that he was going to be sacrificed on the cross for the sins of the world. And the disciples were sad, and he said, after I go, I will send you the comforter. Isn't that a great word? The Holy Spirit. There's there's different words for the Holy Spirit. One of them is, you know the word pneumonia? I think I was in like sixth or seventh grade. I was trying to figure out how to spell pneumonia, like having pneumonia in your lungs, P-N-E-U-M-O-N-I-A. And the Holy Spirit in Greek is pneuma, wind, The Holy Spirit is the comforter. The Holy Spirit in you, as a Christian, the Holy Spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So there's hope and there's comfort and there's been a deposit placed inside of you that's a promise from God himself, one who never breaks his promise. He never breaks his promises. He's never never done that and he never will. And that's a guarantee. It's a deposit that's been made inside of you it's 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 what animates your christian life 
And it's a guarantee given, given us by his Holy Spirit. It's the end of verse 5. Verse 6. This has to be preached to you. This has to be preached to me. As a follower of Jesus. Okay? Because we forget this. Verse 6. We are always confident... Even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not home with the Lord. We live by believing and not seeing. Right? Faith is the evidence of things unseen, those things hoped for. So we live by believing and not seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, verse 8. And we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we, we, we will be at home with the Lord. That's incredible. The pastor that was visiting here yesterday was reciting uh, scripture. He's reading it. Death, where is your sting? You have nothing to be afraid of. You know that? You have nothing to be afraid of. Because to be absent from the body is to be home with the Lord. You have nothing to be afraid of. I'm smiling because men, we, we don't, we're not afraid of anything. We're, we, we get stressed, we're stressed, but we're not afraid. That's not true. We're afraid, and then as we get afraid, we worry. And then as you worry, you get stressed. And then it's maybe acceptable to say, well, I'm kind of stressed today. But underneath that, sometimes, can be fear. But ultimately, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear but fear itself. Was that Roosevelt? I can't remember who that is. Is that Roosevelt? Um, but imagine this. They could come in here right now and lock the doors with guns. They could say, uh, renounce Jesus or die. And you could face death and say, I'm his. And they could shoot you dead. They'd shoot me dead. And to be absent from the body is to be home with the Lord. You have nothing to be afraid of. Isn't that incredible? That actually, isn't that a great comfort? Do you know how many people are afraid of dying? Well, I think number one is public speaking. But close to it, close second or third is, uh, I mean, to come up here and, and you know, come on up here and talk. Here, I'll give you the headset. No, no. <laughs> I'd rather die first. <laughs> I think it's really close, neck and neck. But you don't even have to be afraid of that. But imagine your life being lived as one who is not afraid. And if you are not afraid, if your citizenship is in heaven, if you realize that to be absent from the body, no matter what happens, worst case scenario, is you die in your home with the Lord, how would your life be different? How would you live your life differently? Would you risk more? Would you share more? Would you love more? Would you say I love you more? Would you encourage more? Would you give more? How would your life be different? Living it fearlessly for Christ. Verse 9. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. The follower of Jesus is seeking to please him. How do I please Jesus? How do I please God? Trust and obey. I I can't remember the rest. There's no other way. Trust and obey. So we read his word so that we know what he wants from us. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll follow my commandments. You'll read his word, right? James says, faith without works is dead. We're not earning our faith by what we do, but in response to following him, to what he's done for us, we have to know what he wants of us. And our goal is, as a follower of Christ, is to please him, okay? Okay? That isn't your salvation. Your salvation is a gift. It's a free gift from God by the grace of God. 
But then what you do with the rest of your life, whether it's 81 years or 95 years, whatever that time length is, should be focused on pleasing God. And then verse 10. This is to the Christian. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We must all stand before Christ to be judged. Well, I'm saved. I've, I've been forgiven, so I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm not going to be judged. What, well, have your sins been forgiven in Christ? Have you accepted the free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins through Christ? Yes, yes. Okay. Then you won't be judged as far as whether you're going to be in hell, separated from God, or whether you'll be in heaven because of what Christ has done for you. However, there is another judgment. And the judgment is, what did you do with your life? How did you respond to the forgiveness when you met Christ? How did you live then afterwards? What did you do with it? You've been given an inheritance. I'm being very careful here with this. You're not saved by what you do. You're saved by Jesus and what he did. And then how you live the rest of your life, there is judgment on that. And watch, it says, we all must stand before, the, before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. There are rewards in heaven. This terrifies me. You know what I really don't like about being a pastor? I'll just be honest. When you read about a church leader or a pastor, they're judged more harshly and more seriously and with a greater judgment than if you aren't a leader or aren't a pastor. And that's what can wake me up in the middle of the night. It isn't being pleasing and being popular and being liked. Those things are good and, and, and helpful. But the fact that I will be judged as a pastor. And so it's a, it's a humbling, serious consideration that I'll be judged. However, my responsibility to you as the body of Christ, is to equip you with God's word of what it says. And what it says is, whatever you've done, good or evil, you've done in the earthly body, you will be judged for that. There are, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. In my house, there are many mansions. So there will be rewards. And there will be consequences too. And that's very serious. But it's also comforting to know to back up and go back to fearlessness that in Christ you can live a fearless way it's better to fear him than to fear man to fear the culture to fear popularity to fear acceptance of others verse 11 because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord we work hard to persuade others We've been talking a lot about evangelism. I'm starting to back off a little bit on evangelism because for the last decade or so, my passion has been sharing my faith. And I press that button. And most pastors don't. Most pastors just kind of go through the sermon, have a great day, we'll see you next week. My passion is, is that as you grow in Christ, you will share your faith and love of Christ to others. To love others, and to share Christ when and where you can. And so that is the work that you persuade others to consider Christ, verse 11. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No. We are giving you a reason to be proud of us. So you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we are crazy... It is to bring glory to God. It's crazy to stand for Christ. It's crazy to say, you know what? I love you, I care about you, and Jesus is the only way. He is God. 
Buddhism is not the right way. Yoga is not the right way. Hinduism is not the right way. Mormonism is not the right way. Being uh, active in a gay lifestyle or being active in uh, a lifestyle that is not in, in uh, traditional marriage between a man and a woman in marriage is not the right way. Um, pornography is not the right way. Transgender is not the right way. Islam is not the right way. Um, Atheism is not the right way. Agnostic is not the right way. Jesus is the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When they said to him, when they were accusing him, tell us plainly, are you the son of God? He said, a go away me. I am that I am. He is God. He is the only way. There is no other way in which a man or woman can be saved than through Jesus Christ. That's intolerant. That is not very nice it's not acceptable it's not politically correct it is the gospel it is the truth and however the lord wants to use you say lord use me to share the fact that you made every single person in your image and that you want them to know you and the fact that i do know you means i have the privilege of introducing you to other people and that might seem crazy if, if, if it seems we are crazy, Paul writes, it is to bring glory to God. It's to elevate Jesus, not ourselves. You don't need more Marcus. You need more Jesus. You don't need another pastor. But, but you need more Bible. You need more Jesus. You want more prayer? You will grow in him. He will grow in your life. And as you grow, you'll be compelled by love of Christ to share him with others. And if we are in our right minds, Paul says, it is for your benefits. Either way, Christ's love controls us since we believe that Christ died for all. Christ died for the Muslim. Christ died for the atheist. Christ died for the person that hates God, who's in politics and going against the church. God, Christ died for them. We also believe that, he, that we died to our old life. The term born again. Are you born again? Oh, I'm not religious. I'm not born again. The 20th century saw all kinds of examples of born again. You saw some crazy people born again. But Jesus said, you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So your old life is dead. Your new life is with Christ. We believe that Christ died for all. We also believe that we have died to our old life Verse 15, Jesus died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for yourself. Instead, you will live for Christ who died and was raised for you. I can't even, I can't, I can't describe, I can't give you a metaphor big enough to the inheritance that was given to you in Christ. A trillion dollars wouldn't even come close. But he died so that you would no longer live for yourself. Instead, you would live for Christ who died and was raised for you and for the people that you are around, the people that you're around this afternoon and tomorrow and this week, Christ died for them. Are you living for yourself? A lot of the time. Verse 16, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought Christ was merely a form of a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ, you've become a new person, a new creation. The old is gone, new life has begun. All this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be 
our offering of sin so that we would be made right with God through Christ. Propitiation and exchange, the great exchange. All of the sin and all of the things you've done in your life were put on Jesus. And Jesus was separated from the Father on the cross because he bore our sins. What were Jesus, what were some of his last words? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God the Father turned away from Christ, God the Son, because sin is not in the presence of a holy God. And Jesus, for that moment on the cross, bore our sins. He was covered in sin. He was filled with sin, with my sin and your sin. And he died to sin and overcame sin by rising again. And his righteousness, his holiness, his worthiness was given to you and your sinfulness was given to him. And now for the rest of your life, whether it's three weeks from now that you pass away or God comes back first, in response to that free gift that he's given you in Christ, you wake up each day and look around you and you're surrounded by people that God loves. doesn't matter who they are, where they are, what they are, or where they're from. God loves them. And if you look up and say, God, change my heart to love them as much as you love them. And I don't know what to say, but use me today. And you do a little bit of my Bible memorization and you do some praying and you worship the Lord with some some music or however you want to worship him and you come to church and you get encouraged in Christ, we're stirring up the hornet's nest. But God will grow you and it doesn't matter if you're 83 years old or 43 years old. There's still time to grow and there's still time to be used. And I'll, I'll close with this. I, I lost a good friend of mine uh, a little over a year ago. She was 98. Her name was Ace. And I went to see Ace. She was volunteering twice a week at Prop Shop thrift store hard of hearing we'd stand in the middle of the storm we pray together out loud but she was hard of hearing so we're like lord please bless everyone help us use us today to share jesus christ that you died on the cross you rose again that you love people help us to be ambassadors help us to share you to live as christ to die as gain we will be with home with you someday lord and i went to see ace in the hospital 98 years old i mean you, you know how many facial expressions you do in 98 years every little crack and crease and wrinkle was in her face smiles and frowns and sadness all of the decades in her face and she's lying there and you know what what ace is thinking about Ace is thinking about the women that she has shared Jesus with over the years at Prop Shop and how she's concerned because they don't know Jesus. And we prayed for them before she died. 98. What a, I think the Lord introduced me to Ace before I got to this church. To, um, well, you could look at it two ways. To encourage you or to not let you off the hook. Which I'm not sure which, I'm not sure where to go with this on this to encourage you because you know what? It's like a little kid running through a sprinkler on a hot summer day. It's fun. It's actually thrilling to share Jesus and to love people and to take risks and to live fearlessly. It's the funnest way to live. I know funnest, is funnest a word? I know funner is not a word, but I love funner. It's a great way to live. And actually, the Lord will judge us on what we do with the lives and the gifts that he's given us. You are in ministry. You don't have to be a pastor to be in ministry. If you are born again, if you've accepted Christ, if you've received Jesus, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're in ministry, and the Lord will use you. And this church will continue to become a place of equipping as you follow him and grow in him and make him known. Let's pray. Lord, right above the door, it says to know God and make God known. And Paul wrote that he wanted to know you and the power of his resurrection, your resurrection, Jesus.